But uh, today is very special. You realize that normally every year we celebrate it on man's actual birthday on 2nd February. And this time we are doing it in January, in the last week of January, on the 31st, right? But it's very special in a different way and I'll tell you in a little while. But before that, I'd like to tell you why and how man arrived here. I guess you all know, you might have heard, but I'll refresh your memory. The year, you see, she was born in 1936, February 1936, 2nd 1936. In the year 1953, so how, how old would she be? Quick math. How old would she be in 1953? 1953. 1953 minus 1936 is what? That's right. So she was just a young girl of 17. Now I'd like to tell you that she was a little different from young girls of 17 who study in the Future Foundation School. Why? Because she studied in a school called Duff School in uh, North Calcutta. It was run by uh, Scottish nuns. And she went there till class 6, or rather till the end of class 5, I think. And the rule was that, you see, Duff was a primary school those days. And if you had to continue into high school, you went to St. Margaret's. Her, her home was orthodox. So they didn't allow her to go carry on schooling. They said now, and she was you know, at home called Cookie. So Cookie has learnt enough up to class 5. Let, let her stay at home, study Sanskrit and learn cooking. So now, with the little account you heard from Devantan Amman, you'll understand that this is not the kind of person you, we are talking about. Cooking, learning Sanskrit, staying home in class 6, doing Alpona, because there was a deity in the house, Goddess Annapurna. Nevertheless, she did that. Because it was a joint family, she did that, but she continued studying. And she finished her schooling and whatever, and she passed her matriculation as well. When that happened, so you can understand the kind of environment she would live in, very, very cloistered at home. At 17, with her cousin, and her, you see her name was Jaya, and her first cousin's name was Vijaya. They were born in the same year, and you know, uh, one day apart. So they were very, very close to each other. So Joya and Vijaya, two young 17-year-old girls, wanted to really savor the world outside. And they went out on an expedition with one of their very close friends, happened to be her own uncle, and their uncle rather. And the three of them embarked on a visit of South India. It was in the course of this visit they planned to go to Rameshwaram, Chennai and other places. But in the course of that trip, they met somebody on the train. And these guys spoke about two things. They, they spoke about Pankaj Malik, but they were not Bengalis. Pankaj Malik was a legendary Rabindu Shangit singer, so they got talking about Pankaj Malik. When it was, when the whole conversation became quite warm, they suggested that these people must visit Pondicherry. So that was how she, her cousin and her uncle landed up in Pondicherry for the first time in 1953 and as she recounted many, many times to many people, and it's a known story, those days if you wanted to go to the ashram in Pondicherry, you had to take prior permission. Otherwise you could go to the town, but you would not be able to go into the ashram. So anyway, they arrived and she was put in where well, they found accommodation in a hell hole of a hotel. Why do I call it a hell hole? Pondicherry then, much less now, was the liquor capital of India. It was not yet independent. It was part still of French India. So the prices of wine, whiskey, beer, everything was much cheaper than anywhere else in India. So most people went to Pondicherry just to drink. Drink, as is popularly called booze, get drunk and whatever. So they, they stayed in the hellhole of a hotel and eventually somehow they met the mother 
and the mother arranged for her a special guest house for them where they could stay. So that's the long and short of the story. But then after that what happened is these two young girls, particularly uh, Dryer Ma'am, got so enamored of the mother's presence that you see that time the mother would play tennis on the tennis court, she would move around in the city in her car, you know, she would open various things, she would distribute sweets. So the whole day from morning 6 o'clock, when she would give balcony, a uh, darshan from the balcony, which still is there, the balcony darshan is still called, 6 a.m. till night, these three people were just following her around. It was not that they had to, but she felt like doing that. After a couple of days or three days, I don't know exactly how much time they spent, she concluded she had found heaven. Did you hear me right? That she had found heaven. And then she told her uncle, I'm not going back. That heaven was not just the place of Pondicherry, it was the presence of the mother and she felt she could not physically leave the mother. So the uncle pleaded with her, it was her mother's brother, and she said, first time in your life you've gone out of the home. And if I go back and tell them that you have come out, you know, and you're not going back, imagine what's going to happen to me. So that's how, with all those stories, she was inconsolable, but anyway, she came back to Calcutta. That was 1953, the very next year, you know, but she continued with that perception of having found heaven and meeting the mother. The last time when, you know, she met the mother on that trip, she went to the mother and the mother was distributing sweets. And you have seen how the chair is. So she would sit on the chair, everyone goes in front, collects the toffee and walks away. In her case, when she went, she felt something. She didn't want to meet the mother's eyes. So she lowered her eyes even more. The more she lowered her eyes, the mother lowered her own eyes even more. And finally, when you know she couldn't do anything different, the mother knelt, and then, or not knelt, went forward, and then still peeped into her eyes. At that moment, Jayaman felt that something deep within her heart, her chest, was taken out and forever. So that is the experience she carried. But the mother said one thing more to her, which she didn't understand. That was in French. Many years later, when she went back to Pondicherry for the second time, then she realized she had heard that phrase before from the mother herself. But now I'll tell you something else. In 1965, in the month of May, my grandfather, that means her own father, died. My mother, Joyaman, was very, very attached to her father and she was in deep depression. She could not get over that loss of her father. So, and that was, no, it was not 1965, it was 1963 when that happened. And in 1963, you know, and then for two years she went into an absolute state of depression. In 1965, my father, because you know I was already born, I told you she got married in 1954 and I was born in 1958. So my father was going to his boss's house on 5th of August. And the reason why he was going was his boss had thrown a party in honor of a gentleman who had come from Pondicherry. Who's that gentleman? One guess. Can you? No. It was Pradyut Kumar Bhattacharya, whose, in whose memory, on whose birthday, you had still had the school fete on 31st August. Right? So he was there from Pondicherry. He was in Calcutta, invited into my father's boss's house. It was the 5th of August. And because my father was a very senior person, his boss insisted that he had to come. My father told him, I'm very sorry. My wife is very, very depressed. She lost her father. And, uh, and this went on. And then his boss said, and, but why can't you come so for one day? She said, he said, it happens to be my wedding anniversary. So then he said, why don't you ask your wife also to come? 
So that's how my mother met Sri Pradyal Kumar Bhattacharya, who she grew to call Daddy for the first time, 1965, in Calcutta. All right. And then that evening, she was so happy. The lady who was so depressed for two years was so, so happy meeting somebody from Pondicherry. So she was talking endlessly about, like a little girl, about Pondicherry, about the mother, about the ashram, how it was heaven on earth. And then he said very, very quietly after listening to her for quite some time, if you like Pondicherry so much and you love the mother so much, why don't you do something for her? 1965, her life changed forever because she started to work for the mother. But for five more years, she continued, she hadn't seen the mother from 1953 onwards. And my father used to work in a place called Barauni in Bihar, so whenever we had holidays from school, three times a year, summer, winter and pujas, we would go and visit my father, stay about a month and come back. Pujas was a little shorter, but winter and summer was one month each, and we would spend time there. My mother looked after the garden, she was a very good gardener, a very good cook, anyway, all that story you know. And my father finally got transferred back to Calcutta in 1969 and became for me a full-time father. Till then he was a part-time father for the first 11 years of my life. But anyway, when he came back in 1969, then they thought that it was time now, you know, to, now to go to Pondicherry because now he was there all the time. So my mother wanted to go and lo and behold, it was decided that she would go for her birthday. Birthdays are very, very special in the ashram. Even today they greet you, they don't say bon anniversaire, which is happy birthday in French, the mother used to wish everybody bon fête. That means it's a happy festival. She believed that it's on that day the Supreme Divine descends into you. And therefore that is a day granted by the Supreme as a special day for that particular person. And if you want the presence of the Divine, that's one day you can aspire and get it very easy. So anyway, it's very, very special and in the ashram you're made to feel very special. So it was discussed, but there was a problem. I was in person, and 2nd of February, I just looked it up this morning on one of your teacher's mobiles, was a Monday. And I had school, and I had exams. So there was no way, and she was a full-time mother. So she said, I can't go leaving my son behind. And he has exams, and you know what happened. So then a compromise was reached between her and her daddy that they would go a week before she and he, just for a couple of days, meet the mother. The mother would wish her specially two or three days before her birthday and she would come back well in time for my school and my exams. So you can guess now what I'm going to tell you. That was the last week of January, either the 30th or the 31st. 50 years ago to this date. It's a remarkable coincidence. It hasn't happened because of this reason. But nevertheless, 50 years ago and 17 years after she had met the mother for the first time, she met the mother again. Between 1953 and 1969, what she was doing for the mother was embroidering wood stools, sending mangoes and lychees for the mother to eat, but that was it. From the time she met the mother the second time, she started doing more. 1971, Sri Aurobindo's birth centenary year started, she plunged headlong into it. And from that day on, therefore, from the fateful that week of January 1970, till the day she actually died in 1999, she became a full-time worker for the mother. From a full-time mother to a full-time worker for the mother, it was a great leap, but she did that. That is what then defined her life. That is what defined her personality. Okay? And 
Before I conclude, I'll just say one thing which I often say, and this is I remember when I was about five or six years old, so that means even earlier to that, and we were in Barani, I told you the story. Barani was those days a fairly deserted place. And we had a car, we were going somewhere, and the car stopped at a gas station, or a petrol pump rather, where you would fill in petrol. And I saw people at that age, and it was remarkable, I was sitting on the front seat, you know, little boys wanting to sit on the front seat of a car, at the age of four or five, is very exciting. I suddenly saw a lot of people running towards the car, in that petrol pump. So, then I heard in Hindi, Indiraji Ayi. So her presence was such, her resemblance with Indira Gandhi at that time, who was the very charismatic Prime Minister of India, was startling. So many people, you know, at a distance would mistake her at that time for Indira Gandhi. But that was how striking her charismatic or charismatic her sheer presence was, which defined her all through her life. So what I'm trying to tell you is, in short, this is a remarkable coincidence 50 years ago, probably to this date, or one day apart, she actually defined the rest of her life and who she was and who she became. Thank you very much.